Welcome all and thank you for joining this webinar co-hosted by KKS Advisors and the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance. For those of you that aren't familiar with KKS, we are an advisory firm specialising in sustainable investment with a vision to reshape markets. What this means to us at KKS is creating a world where business and investment decisions are made for the long term, taking environmental, social and governance factors into account. Our team work across a combination of research, strategy and data projects for our diverse client base that spans investors, foundations, corporates and NGOs. We're really delighted to have many of these clients speaking as part of this two part webinar series and sharing highlights from our collaborative research endeavours with you. Um, this webinar is the first of two parts, with the second part taking place tomorrow at the same time. You can see all our speakers across this webinar series on your screen now, and you'll be meeting some of them later. I'll also share details on how you can sign up to the second part, if you haven't already, at the end of today's discussion. I would now like to briefly introduce the stellar lineup of today's speakers that you'll shortly be hearing from, before I hand over to my co-host, Don Chu, who is the Editor-in-Chief at the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance, to say a few introductory words and give you some context to the, the journal's recent special issue on sustainable financial management. Firstly today, we have Hannah Saltman, Manager of the Governance Program at Ceres, the nonprofit organization with a strong legacy of working with investors and companies to create economic solutions to the world's biggest sustainability challenges. She is going to be speaking to us about why board leadership is essential for solving critical sustainability issues like climate change. Second up, we will have Brian Tomlinson, who is the research director of the Strategic Investor Initiative at CECP, which over the last couple of years have provided a forum for company CEOs to share their long-term plans to investors. Brian will share the findings of a recent event study that explored the economic significance of companies presenting their long-term plans. To conclude the first part of this webinar series, we will hear from Hannah Jacobson, who is a director at Summa Equity, a Nordic private equity firm who have been successful in making ESG a competitive advantage. We will hear from Hannah how Summa Equity is using ESG to create value and minimise risk. So following Hannah's presentation, we will also have around 10 minutes available to take some of your questions. You can submit these at any point during the webinar through clicking on the question mark on the right hand of your webinar screen, as you can see here in this screenshot. We would also encourage you to tweet about the webinar using the hashtag reshaping markets and get in touch with us after the webinar via our info at kksadvisors.com account. I'll make sure to forward your questions on to the relevant speaker or member of our team. So I would now like to introduce Don Chu to say a few introductory words. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for including me in this. Um, I've been editing the uh, Journal of Applied Corporate Finance for a long, long time now, and we've always tried to show how companies can create long-term value for their shareholders, and it's been a fairly constant message, but in the last 15 or 20 years, uh, corporations are being asked to do a lot more to, to deal with social problems, and the question is, how can they do that while still taking care of their shareholders? Uh, Michael Jensen wrote this wonderful paper about 20 years ago called the Corporate Objective Function, and he came up with a model called Enlightened Value Maximization, which basically urges companies to invest in all their major stakeholders, but but invest a dollar in present value only if you're going to you're going to get a dollar in return. So in other words, it's all about investing in all your stakeholders, but investing in the right the right amount, not too much, not too little. So as I see it, there are two big challenges for companies in addressing social problems and earning high rates of return. And one is, you know, how do you figure out how much, to, which of your stakeholders that you need to invest in and how much? And then the second question is, once you've made these investing decisions, uh, how, how do you persuade your shareholders that you've done the right thing if these investors have a long run payoff? Uh, about a year ago, George Serafim and, and Chris Pinney and I I got together and we decided to put together an issue that talks about uh, changes in financial institutions that have actually made this this feat more possible. And uh, one of them is is really the long-term corporate plan that that uh, Brian Tomlinson is going to talk about. The idea of getting your largest institutional investors in a room and having the 
CEOs of companies present their long-term plans, what they're going to do about it, and how, how does it earn money for shareholders, and what does it do for society. And uh, in our issue, we had a nice example of that. Uh, Kevin Clark from Aptiv uh, presented their plan to create you know, you know, electric cars and driverless cars and, and how they take care of their stakeholders. And that company is overseen by Raj Gupta, uh, chairman of the board of, of the several, several companies. And his Roman Haas produced the second highest rate of return uh, for, during the 10 years that he was CEO. So he's a guy who knows how to create value for shareholders and also do good for society. Uh, the other, so in addition to the long-term plan, um, We've also seen active investors make innovations. Uh, I think Hannah is going to talk about uh, Summa Equity and their ability to find investments in, in good causes and, and to make money out of it. And they've also found investors that want to invest in these causes. And to me, that's critical. Uh, you, you really need to go out and find the investors that are right for your company. And then the last question we're going to deal with is, is changes in boards. Uh, what can boards do differently? in order to help companies do a better job. And, and uh, I, 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 I've forgotten, uh, the Hannah Saltman, is that, I missed that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we were gonna have a presentation on what boards can do to make it easier for companies to uh, communicate with their shareholders and to do a good job. Uh, that's all I have in here, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, John. Um, and so without any hesitation, on to our first speaker, um, Hannah Saltman from Ceres. Great. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you so much to Sophie and Don for having me on the webinar. It's great to be with you all. So my name is Hannah Saltman, and I am a manager at Ceres on our corporate governance program. So moving to the next slide, a Ceres is a sustainability nonprofit organization based in Boston, uh, working with major companies and investors to examine and act on the financial risks and opportunities behind some of the most pressing sustainability issues of our time. Uh, including climate change, water scarcity, and human rights abuses. So we do this through the four main networks of investors, companies, and nonprofits you see here on the screen, uh, all of whom have committed to working with Ceres to drive solutions in developing a sustainable economy. So moving to the next slide, we'll get into how our work with corporate boards fits in with all of this. So the goal of our governance program is to move corporate boards to make better decisions for sustainability performance improvements. We focus on the board uh, due to their immense leadership potential. They sit at the top of a company's organizational structure. They have the power to hire, fire, and incentivize management. Their networks are significant, meaning that as the average corporate director sits on multiple boards, engaging one director could affect the boardroom discussions of multiple corporations. And lastly, because investors are increasingly interested not just on a company's commitment to relevant sustainability issues, but specifically on the role of the board in overseeing management on these topics. So as fiduciaries to shareholders, directors face increasing asks from investors to demonstrate that they are serving their director duty as stewards of short and long-term value creation for their shareholders. So the foundation of our program really rests on the collateral that we've developed in identifying best practices for how boards can oversee sustainability, which we've largely developed through interviews with directors, investors, and other corporate governance professionals. So our institutional strategy in working with boards really leverages these best practices we've identified to deliver presentations directly to boards, shareholders, and in-house corporate counsel um, that really play a pivotal role in advising the board. And we also have an individual strategy which engages directors as individuals, since boards are ultimately made up of people. We partner with major director associations such as the National Association of Corporate Directors here in the United States uh, to feature our collateral to their network of over 20,000 U.S. corporate directors. So moving to the next slide, this really gets to the heart of why it matters that boards oversee sustainability and how we're also seeing that directors still by and large are not doing this. So climate change and other sustainability issues uh, pose clear business risks and opportunities. The latest IPCC report highlighted that action is needed more urgently than ever. Um, you'll see on the left side of the slide here that West Global Risk Report flagged climate change is accounting for four out of five of the high impact likelihood of risks facing the world today. 
And investors are taking note. So some of the largest asset owners, uh, such as the California Pension Funds, as well as asset managers, such as BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, are calling directly for boards to be competent on both climate and sustainability issues. So we're seeing that the financial community is focusing on these issues as business issues. However, you'll see on the right side of the slide that in a recent survey of US corporate directors, just 6% saw climate change as having an impact on the company over the next 12 months. And other studies of directors in states flag a similar low level of attention by directors uh, to both climate and sustainability issues in the boardroom. So going to the next slide, we really see that combining all of these elements together, there's a strong business case for why boards need to understand how climate and sustainability issues impact their business. So namely, that these issues, one, can be material to corporations over a variety of timeframes, both the short, medium, and long term. Two, when a sustainability issue is material to a company, directors have a responsibility to educate themselves on the issue before making business decisions and act. And three, investors understand and are calling for boards to demonstrate what they are doing to oversee the integration of these topics within the company's strategy, risk management structures, uh, as well as executive compensation incentive structure to safeguard their invested assets and advance at value creation. So turning to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about a report that we embarked on about two years ago um, as a research project to test our, our very own program's theory of change. So we partnered with KKS advisors uh, to create a benchmarking report called Systems Rule, uh, which is an analysis of 475 of the world's largest publicly traded companies, where we really asked three key questions. What board governance systems for sustainability are in place at these companies? Are they any good? And does their presence on a board make a difference to the sustainability performance of a company? So before I turn to the results, a little bit of background on which governance systems we evaluated. Uh, so we first looked at the existence of a formal mandate for sustainability, meaning at least one board committee charter included sustainability. Uh, the second being sustainability expertise. So looking for at least one director to mention some kind of environmental or social expertise within their board bio on the company's website. And lastly, looking at the company's incentive structures to determine if a portion of the executive compensation plan was linked to a sustainability metric. So the results, as you can see on this slide, were quite telling. Um, the first being that while many companies stated that their board oversaw sustainability, the systems that were in place at the board level were largely rudimentary or piecemeal. So only about a third of companies had a committee charter uh, that included sustainability. Um, only 17% had at least one director with some kind of sustainability expertise, and we really did cast quite a broad net there. And only 6% of companies linked executive compensation with some kind of sustainability metric. However, the companies that had these systems in place were best positioned for sustainability performance, and perhaps most tellingly, the best performing companies on sustainability had integrated systems for board governance, including formal mandates, expertise, and incentive structures. So going to the next slide, I'm going to end by breaking down what this means for both companies and investors. So the first takeaway here is that companies need to create board governance systems that are integrated with and reinforce one another. So formal mandates for climate and sustainability at the board level need to be supported by the recruitment of directors with the right expertise, which in turn needs to motivate management by linking executive compensation with sustainability performance, as this will set the tone and accountability expectations across the entire company. The second piece of this is that directors need to move to a more results-oriented oversight approach when it comes to sustainability. So examining, are the company's total emissions going down? Are zero carbon investments going up? As governance systems that don't produce measurable results are not effective. The third piece here is that boards need to drive materiality assessments around climate and sustainability and then act. So not all sustainability issues are material to every company, but there is now enough evidence about the potential for material impacts to prompt boards to encourage management to make the necessary assessments. So such assessments need to keep in mind the perspectives of both shareholders and stakeholders, as well as the time frame of these impacts on the company. So as a quick example, the board risk committee of the insurance company Aviva has integrated climate change within its board discussions alongside geopolitical and strategic risks. And finally, 
we need to see increased disclosure on the role of the board in prioritizing and addressing sustainability priorities, as this can spur more sustainability improvements. So disclosure frameworks such as the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure are now asking for specific information on the company's governance structures and focus on financially relevant climate disclosure in order to influence both investor and corporate decision making. So ultimately what we see here is that corporate boards are in this very unique position to provide leadership and motivation um, with their role as stewards of long-term corporate value and their responsibility to hold management accountable for corporate resilience in the face of disruptive risks. Boards are in a clear position to drive performance on both climate and sustainability. So strong governance systems will be the element that allows them to discharge this responsibility effectively. So with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Brian Tomlinson from the Strategic Investor Initiative at CECP. Thank you for that, uh, Hannah, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, I'm Brian Tomlinson, I'm the Research Director at the Strategic Investor Initiative at CECP. Uh, the context for our work at the Strategic Investor Initiative and indeed for this paper published in the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance is the broadly expressed concerns around market short-termism. Um, next slide, please. These have been very broadly uh, expressed by a series of key market participants. At our annual board of boards, CEOs say that 86% uh, of them are too short-term in their own practice as CEOs. Uh, Investors say that only a minority of their portfolio companies are communicating successfully their long-term strategy. So across both CEOs, corporate side and investor side, you have this concern around short-termism. The Securities and Exchange Commission, interestingly, has also engaged with this recently. Uh, they issued a request for comment earlier this year and then held a round table on short-termism in public markets, at which we were very pleased to speak, identifying our work as a potential market-based solution to some of the issues around short-termism. So have broad-based broad concern and this increase as well in the sort of demand side for long-term information. Uh, you've seen the calls very prominently from BlackRock and Vanguard uh, in different ways, but asking for the sim similar things for companies to do a better view of setting out uh, their long-term view. And you've also seen uh, a related development of the overall decline of quarterly uh, earnings per share guidance, now disfavored by NERI and a range of other organizations saying that longer term guidance ought to be better for companies and the investors that they're communicating with. Um, short termism does also appear to have real world impact, uh, impacting both managerial decision making and then the performance of uh, the companies. So. One of the seminal pieces of publishing here indicates that uh, companies would rather cut things like R&D and discretionary spending rather than uh, miss an earnings target. Um, doing that just for one quarter might not be much cause for alarm, but doing that o over several reporting cycles and across sectors and across companies is gonna have economy-wide impacts. Um, and as you can see from recent papers from McKinsey and KPMG, uh, Long-term focus companies tend to uh, perform better, higher earnings quality, um, um, better job creation, uh, more stable revenues, but both in the short term and, and the long term. So things that managers ought to be uh, interested in. And then I suppose the background uh, as well to this is just this increasing rise and rise of ESG investors regarding the consideration of ESG as part of the, their fiduciary duty, it becoming increasingly a mainstream practice, and also the acknowledgement that ESG's contribution to value creation tends to play out over the medium to long term, though of course it can crystallize in the short term. So that's kind of the, the context for why we are working on this, and we cover some of that in the early part of the white paper. Next slide, please. So we've had a little bit of this blame game between investors and, and CEOs on the sources of short-termism, so we thought, why not cut through some of that noise? And since uh, 2017, uh, we've hosted uh, around 30 companies to come and deliver what we call a long-term strategic plan at one of our CEO investor forums. This is a Reg FD forum. The CEO makes a conference style presentation, trying to set out a longer term time horizon than is often traditionally covered um, in investor facing presentations. And you can see there, 
companies from across sectors, um, from healthcare, financials, utilities, automotive, um, and others, and great engagement um, from the uh, with the CEOs by the investors there on uh, long-term themes. So that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And our work with KKS, uh, we wanted to really answer um, two questions. Um, so if we have CEOs coming and delivering a long-term plan, you know, what should they say? That's a question that the CEOs ask us and what do investors want to know? And then the second set of questions is, you know, what impact might uh, making these disclosures have on the capital markets? And also then what will companies um, disclose? So in our work with KKS Advisors and also uh, George Serafim at Harvard Business School, we wanted to set out a content framework, which is set out on the next slide. Now, we began providing uh, content uh, guidance. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, we provided, uh, we begin, began providing content gu guidance to the presenting companies uh, in 2017 in the form of an investor letter, which was signed by uh, Vanguard, State Street, New York Common, Neuburger Berman, and a range of other um, investors where we set out seven questions every CEO should be able to answer and identified a longer term time horizon for CEOs to address in these presentations. Building on all the other great work that has happened in this space, particularly by organizations like uh, SCLT Global, who really are a, a leading practitioner in this space, and uh, McKinsey, and then drawing on hundreds and hundreds of pieces of feedback that we've received from institutional investors over the last couple of years, we wanted to kind of throw our guidance into this framework to try to give a, a non-prescriptive high-level guide to the type of themes that corporations ought to be trying to touch on um, in a long-term plan. As you can see, it, it's a mix of uh, elements that you would expect to see uh, in most uh, IR decks, in addition to uh, themes that have tended to generally be kind of sequestered off in their sustainab in sustainability reports and on corporate websites. So we're trying to pull all that together into a coherent narrative where companies can come and talk to these themes about how they drive long-term value. Um, so as you can see, you have uh, uh, things like uh, uh, trends, um, uh, mega trends such as you know the transition to the low carbon economy um, for the utilities, you know changing demographics and healthcare costs for healthcare companies. Um, you can see uh, uh, that we ask companies to address corporate purpose. Uh, critical for companies to have a authentic and meaningful narrative um, around that. You know, we don't necessarily expect companies to engage with all nine themes uh, in a, a long-term plan presentation, but we expect them to use these to help them um, tell their story. And we've had some excellent examples of companies um, doing this very well. I'd highlight people like Nestle and BD, who've done a terrific job in that. Next slide, please. So then in addition to developing the content framework, as I said, we wanted to uh, look at what uh, corporations disclosed and the extent to which the markets reacted to those presentations. So looking at what was disclosed, we wanted to see where, where were corporations focusing in terms of their disclosures and what was the quality of the information that they disclosed. So adapting a, a very useful um, framework developed by the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, we uh, threw each of the content of these long-term plans into a framework where we looked at whether or not there was disclosure on the theme, whether it was boilerplate disclosure on the theme, whether or not there were backward-looking metrics and forward-looking uh, metrics to see uh, the quality of the disclosure provided. Obviously, what we are looking for in the context of a long-term plan is mostly forward-looking information across an extended time horizon. Obviously, under certain uh, types of content, um, particularly financial, there is a degree of wariness about how far into the future you can um, project. But obviously, there are a range of other metrics that you can present, particularly around ESG, where the goals may be um, aspirational, where a longer-term time horizon is uh, perhaps easier to address. Uh, next slide, please. And we also concluded an event study uh, where we looked at the extent to which the equity markets react in an event window around the long-term plan presentations to the, to the presentations. The, the thesis there 
uh, is that if the markets are reacting to a meaningful extent, um, then these uh, presentations, in the short term at least, are disclosing information that the market regards as, to some extent, uh, economically significant, value relevant, uh, useful for investment decisions. Uh, and this slide uh, summarizes some of those findings. So we did find um, some uh, market reactions to these presentations, particularly in terms of stock returns and trading volumes. Um, those were statistically significant, and we also use an underlying methodology, admittedly on a smaller sample size, uh, which reflects that which is used in other um, academic studies. So this is early evidence of economic significance of uh, these plans, which we were um, encouraged by. Um, we did note that there were no revisions in analyst forecasts in response to these plans. That, to me, that makes a lot of intuitive sense, given that I think analysts tend to be interested in the disclosures made in the earnings call, and these are a longer-term, um, longer-term uh, uh, metrics disclosed. In terms of disclosure against the themes, uh, we note that with, there was quite a lot of uh, forward-looking information on themes like competitive positioning and trends. Um, um, and financial performance, though often on a, a sh slightly shorter term look forward, uh, where companies are providing some forward-looking financial uh, guidance. And interestingly, uh, not a great deal uh, of disclosure uh, around the, the corporate governance um, theme. Um, that is something that has improved significantly over time from the from sort of the, the earlier presentations to the later presentations. But that's something that um, corporations need to uh, get a grip on um, and also as we know from uh, Hannah's prior presentation this really is extremely important for boards to get the long-term strategy of the company um, gripped um, particularly the sustainability themes that underlie that uh, we have seen some disclosure progress from um, uh, with more less companies um, uh, uh, sitting in the no disclosure uh, uh, camp which is good and just to identify a couple of uh, very good presentations again bd medtronic nestle aptiv as uh, don mentioned earlier uh aptiv gave a, a great presentation it's worth looking at that in addition to just the event study one of the things that we also wanted to look at is the range of other potential benefits to reorienting your disclosures towards the long term you know, the academic literature does indicate that to the extent that you disclose more long-term information, you will attract more uh, long-term investors to your investor base. That has a whole range of uh, positive managerial benefits um, for you. Uh, in addition, being more fulsome in setting out your long-term strategy and, and getting the support of your long-term investors may assist you in terms of uh, activism uh, defense. Obviously, that's an area that's getting a lot of attention these days. And in addition to disclose more fit, to disclose on more themes and to disclose on a longer time horizon, you know, you may need to do more things internally. Uh, disclosure can operate as a forcing function um, in that respect. And in terms of some of the companies that we've talked to, we've certainly found that they've said that in order to disclose on the themes that we're asking in an investor-facing setting, they do have to have more um, internal collaborations, particularly between investor relations and uh, corporate sustainability to ensure that they are kind of level set and agree on what's important. Uh, as one of our companies said, you know, in order to get this done, we had to lock um, corporate sustainability and investor relations in a room until they agreed with each other. Um, so there are the, these both capital markets benefits and then also internal benefits to more long-term disclosure. Uh, you know, lot, uh, the, being able to get your arms around these themes is likely to make you a better company over the longer term. And just uh, moving to the last slide, um, you know, one of the things that we always want to see is you know, granular, specific, uh, materiality-focused, uh, contextualized information um, from uh, companies. So moving away from the sort of impression management greenwash that has often been a bit of a problem uh, in the particularly ESG uh, space. And we've really seen um, progress away from, you know, this sort of solar panels and prizes 
to materiality matrices and metrics, which we're very pleased um, to see progress on. Um, so I'll hand over now to uh, Hannah Jacobson at uh, Summa Equity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Hannah Jacobson, and I work as a director with Summa Equity, which is a Nordic private equity company that we established in 2016. And I will tell you more about our investment strategy and how to use ESG to create the more value and less risk. Moving on to next slide. Um, the world today is at a tipping point. And we have had yet another summer with extreme weather around the world. The glaciers in Greenland are disappearing at an unpleasant rate. The Amazon rainforest has seen an increase in the number of forest fires. We can see Britain is about to leave the EU and demonstrations are taking place in Hong Kong as well as other places. And the challenges of climate change inequality, increasing death levels, stagnating financial growth and political polarization are unfolding simultaneously after decades of buildup. And the current global environment contains many uncertainties and it is difficult to know how to invest. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we can see that in this uncertain world, some things are certain. The population is increasing from seven to 10 billion creating positive tailwind for agri and aquaculture. We see scarce resources creating positive growth for waste and recycling as well as circular economy. We live longer, bringing growth in healthcare and infrastructure sectors. People are moving because of unrest and urbanization. And this creates investment opportunities within education, security, public services, and infrastructure, to mention a few. And also due to climate change, we do need to reduce our CO2 emissions. Uh, we need to improve our energy efficiency and also promote new energy sources. And finding solutions to these challenges represents a $12 trillion opportunity, according to some sources meaning that our biggest challenges are also our biggest investment opportunities, given that the demand for solutions in these challenges is constantly growing. Looking back, and also if we can move to the next slide, um, back in the 1980s, private equity firms created value primarily through financial engineering. And in the 1990s, you saw PE 2.0 being more focused on operational improvement to improve margins. Starting in the 2000s, PE 3.0 started to see a more strategic improvement and in institutional building in order to compete with strategic buyers. But things are constantly changing and now we're seeing private equity evolving into a new model and that's what we call private equity 4.0. Because with strong megatrends and increasing awareness of our global challenges, we believe that those companies that contribute to solving the challenges are the ones that will see the strongest growth. And the risk of decreasing valuations and underperformance in operation is increasing for those companies that create negative externalities and thereby add to our challenges. The megatrends, however, will provide market growth tailwind in the affected markets. In private equity 4.0, we are enhancing existing capabilities by adding the effective management of the externalities and also environmental, social and governance or ESG factors. By incorporating ESG risks and opportunities in investment strategy and the value creation approach, we believe it's uh, essential uh, in the current and also future business environments. And the private equity firms and investment firms that do this successfully are uh, most likely to improve their returns 
while at the same time reducing their vulnerability to risk. If we move to the next slide, um, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are 17 problem areas that need to be solved. It is a great framework to assess how a company is adding positively or negatively to their externalities. We could also call it external rate of return. At Summa Equity, we invest thematically in what we call resource efficiency, which is in essence the env environment or E in S ESG, and which as well is covered by UN SDG number 6, 13, 15, and uh, 13, 14, and 15. And we further invest in what we call changing demographics, which is in essence the uh, social or the S in ESG, and it's covered by eight of the SDGs. Lastly, we invest in tech-enabled businesses and the companies that do not overlap with our resource efficiency or changing demographic focus are companies driven by regulatory changes and making the world more compliant, transparent and more productive. In essence, the G or governance uh, in ESG which again is well covered by four of the SDGs. Our thematic approach uh, is to focus on companies that will excel in a challenging world, uh, as well uh, uh, as it's aligned with both uh, the ESG lens using the SDGs to screen and also develop our companies. I would like to run you through a brief example on the next page uh, from our portfolio. Because on average, each one of us requires over 13 tons of materials a year to support our lifestyle. And over only 5% of the value of this material is recovered. The resources available on the planet are threatened by our overconsumption. And SDG number 11, 12, and 13 all addresses this great challenge. And with the growing population and a growing wealth in the world, this waste problem is only increasing. Suma has therefore invested in a company called Sortera, and that's a Swedish collection and sorting company for building waste. And it's the third largest player in the Swedish market, covering 75% of Sweden. And Sortera provides building bags and containers as well as helping developers to handle their heavy masses according to legislations and also statutory regulations. And the good thing is that the space Sorterra occupies, it benefits from both market and regulatory tailwinds. And therefore, we have been able to grow the company since we acquired it three years ago from having 200 million uh, Swedish kroner in top line to now over 1 billion Swedish kroner. And that's not only by doing some add-on trans, uh, transactions, but also through organic growth and synergies. And with this industrial process, Sorterra is able to turn waste into valuable resources. And this allows the critical material to be reused again and again. And it also contributes to significant CO2 reductions. And the good thing is that this is not only beneficial for the environment, but it only it also increases the company's revenues and margins, and thereby enhances the long-term attractiveness of this business. Where the SDG uh, uh, alignment and measurement are concerned, you can see a, a snip uh, uh, from our portfolio report, where we are looking and measuring at how many tons of waste uh, they are collecting each year, how many percent of this material is recovered, uh, either as materials or energy, and then we can see how much CO2 net saved each year. And in this way, we can also measure the company's impact. Moving to the next slide. Um, as a private equity investor, we own our companies for five to seven years. And when we exit, uh, our new owners will have at least a five to seven year perspective as well. 
meaning that we would need to think five, no, 10 to 15 years ahead. And a company's contribution to externalities and to our challenges will materially impact exit valuation. And on this time scale, operating performance may also be negatively affected by some of the increasing challenges like climate change. In an increasingly transparent world where information travels instantly, risk has increased significantly. Any ESG issue can have damaging effects and we often see a public uproar against whether it's individuals or companies that are adding to our challenges. Meaning that investors, employees, customers and suppliers increase, increasingly see that their interests aligned in wanting uh, companies to be profitable by contributing to solve challenges rather than making problems. And to attract capital, both human and financial, uh, to invest in the best companies and enhance the operational performance of these companies to, in the end, create superior return for our investors. Private equity investors, as well as other investors, should move into this 4.0 model where solving global challenges is embedded. And this should guide both what to invest in and how to direct the strategic and operational agenda for these companies. And dismissing the global challenges as irrelevant will increase risk and lower returns. Thank you, and I'll hand it back to Sophie. Thank you so much, Anna, um, and to all our speakers today. Um, and before we get to some of your questions that you've been submitting via the webinar platform, I wanted to make you all aware that we will be sharing two handouts after today's webinar. The first will be today's slide, so thank you for those who have written in about those. Um, and the second is going to be the full special issue on sustainable financial management. Um, that the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance have really generously agreed to share with all participants of these two webinars. Um, it's important for me also to say that you can also subscribe to the journal by visiting their publisher Wiley's website. Um, the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance is published four times a year um, and they have a range of subscriptions on offer, including for students, individuals and also institutions. So now you all have the opportunity to ask our speakers some questions. Um, and some of you have already sent them in, so we will start with those. Um, please do keep submitting them and we will try to get to them. Um, so as I kind of said at the beginning, um, you can just ask a question by using the question uh, panel to the right of your screen. So the first question is actually one for you, Hannah Jacobson. Um, confusingly, you've got two Hannahs, so I'm addressing <laughs> them with their full names. Um, what have been some of the key outcomes of Summer's approach to ESG? Um, and what advice would Summer have for other private equity firms trying to incorporate ESG into their investment processes? Starting with your last question, I think uh, we should all start somewhere and there are a lot of talk about uh, ESG, SDGs, and there's a lot of frameworks and initiatives, but I think you just have to start somewhere and, uh, and use common sense and raise the awareness and no matter what you're working with, uh, because I think that will take you a long way as a starting point. Um, uh, and I think we all need to do something and that we all can do something that that pushes this in in the right direction so don't take the hurdle too high for yourself to 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 even start uh when it comes to the first question uh so sumo was started in 2015 2016 and at that time i think uh, we were maybe a bit too early talking about the sgds and esg but uh now we have raised two funds and we have seen that uh, our strategy in general has helped us to attract both capital, attract talent and employees to SUMA, and also attract great companies that we now have in our portfolio. So I think it's been very beneficial in, in all those aspects, and maybe especially in, in our sourcing strategy. I see that we have 
at least uh, had an edge in the Nordics on, on how we have used this as an integrated part of our strategy. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Hannah, for that. Um, and one's just come in for, for you, Brian. Um, what is the typical process and, and requirements for a company to develop a good long term plan? Um, and also, what are the next steps for CECP's research? Yeah, thanks very much. That's a great uh, question. So we work pretty closely with the companies that are preparing uh, a long term plan. Uh, we have a series of briefing calls. Uh, we often review their existing disclosures. Uh, we try to ensure that they are uh, bringing the right people um, from their companies into the process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we like to ensure that both uh, investor relations uh, and corporate sustainability are uh, part of the process and ideally co-developing um, that deck, uh, given the type of content that the long-term plan ranges over. Um, we'll tend to review drafts of the uh, presentations um, uh, prior to them being delivered so that we can try to uh, optimize them on the basis of the sort of feedback that we've uh, provided. And we also have a deep uh, a set of briefing materials um, which build out from the content framework uh, I identified earlier. Um, that involves a series of white papers like emerging practice in long-term plans which sets out uh, some of the examples of uh, excellent disclosures that have been made by companies to date. That also includes papers uh, like a mock long-term plan for ExxonMobil, where we actually look at some of the existing disclosures um, by companies um, to just see how many pieces of disclosure you have to go through to try to build um, a long-term plan. Um, and in respect of the company identified, it's around 13. So 13 individual pieces of disclosure to, to, get, to get a handle around the, each of the nine themes. Um, you know, that is a, a degree of a sort of prolixity in a disclosure, which is probably not helpful for the company and, and not helpful for the investors trying to consume it. Um, in terms of uh, our research uh, program, we're doing a, a collaboration at the moment with the uh, New York University Center for Sustainable Business, where we're looking at how you can embed sustainability type disclosures into the framework of the earnings call. I know the earnings call is a very kind of short term focused uh, um, venue for disclosure, but ultimately companies need to be consistent about their disclosures across their reporting ecosystem. Um, and the short-term accountability environment ought to build towards uh, the long-term strategy outlined in a long-term plan. So to ensure that there is sort of consistency across um, across a company's um, disclosure. So that's one project that we're um, looking to uh, publish uh, over the next um, few months. Uh, and if people are interested in other aspects of our work, please feel free to reach out. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, and one more for, for Hannah Jacobson that's just come through. How does SUMA engage with the boards um, of their portfolio companies on an ongoing basis? So we we have our own uh, uh, partners on the board and also our own uh, representatives. And we have this board cycle that we have developed that uh, is quite clear on what um, topics to discuss in each board meeting. And that helps us structure uh, and also make sure that we cover all the important topics each year. Uh, and we have a very close relationship with the, the board and try to have also interactions uh, also more um, uh, between the board meetings. Uh, and But we do need a mix of internal and external participants on, on all our boards. Great, thank you, Hannah. Um, and one for you, Hannah Saltman. Um, what are the main ways in which board oversight of sustainability has evolved in recent years? And do you think boards are changing fast enough? Yeah, it's a great question, Sophie. And, um, you know, I'll start with the evolution that we've seen and then touch on, you know, if it's fast enough. Um, so, really, I think even 
more than five years ago, you know, ESG, sustainability, climate, really wasn't even being laid out for boards as a topic that they should be addressing. Um, it wasn't included within, you know, educational resources as much. It wasn't featured at, you know, director conferences. Um, but we've certainly started to see that change quite significantly in, in recent years. Um, and so now, you know, what we're seeing, and it's interesting because I was just looking at one of the most recent surveys, um, one of the results I touched on were only, you know, recent survey of corporate directors, only 6% said that they would consider the impacts of climate change on their business over the next year. Um, but, you know, a, a corollary question and answer was that directors said they understand that they should probably be doing something around ESG, but they really weren't quite sure what that is yet. Um, so I think that's a new wrinkle in the evolution of how boards, certainly boards of companies based in the United States are thinking about this. Um, and so the, the short answer to your question, you know, are boards changing fast enough is no. Um, you know, particularly if you look at what's coming out of the IPCC report saying that we really only have about 12 years to uh, turn this around in terms of impacts from climate change, um, you know, and, and seeing that also play out in the financial world with, um, you know, PG&E's bankruptcy, which the Wall Street Journal deemed um, this year to be the first climate change related bankruptcy that we've seen yet. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think really we need to drive home uh, with boards, with directors, is that the impacts from climate and sustainability are not going to be felt, you know, 50, 100, 500 years from now. They're being felt now. And as a result, boards really need to start address addressing how the board is integrating these kinds of considerations into how they talk about business strategy and, and risk oversight um, to really understand that, you know, this, these are not things that are happening in some nebulous time frame. It's not only reputational risk that some of these questions that some of these questions and issues will pose. Um, so I think that you know that's going to be a key piece of it to keep moving forward with the corporate director community. Um, you know as we see boards evolve and, and start to strain, change some of their structures and actions they take on these issues. Great, thank you so much, Fana, for that. Um, and we've had we've had one question, and this is really open open to all of you, and actually also kind of links to some of the, of the discussion that we'll have tomorrow in the second part of our webinar series. Um, but it's around the fact that ethical and green investing is still the minority option available um, as a private investor, um, and you could kind of extrapolate that more more widely as well. Um, and and really, this is around kind of what hope is there um, for us to fundamentally shift. Um, this work right across the market. Um, so I don't know if any of any of you um, uh, want to to have a go at that one. Hannah, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on that from, from the series uh, perspective. Yeah, uh, I do see the problem, but still uh, seeing the development just over the last year, I think there's a lot of new initiatives and new funds and alternatives growing. So, so hopefully that development will continue so you can have more options as, as also a private investor to, to place your money in, 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 more future-proof investments as, as we see them. Great, and uh, I, think that's, I think that's definitely right. And, and actually, the other thing I would say is that tomorrow's session, the first part will look at sustainability across the capital markets um, and ask the question, are we there yet? So really good um, bridge to that um, as well. Um, actually, that's based on some, some work kind of looking across the whole capital markets and how sustainability is integra being integrated by different players. So um, there's a small teaser for, for tomorrow's. Um, and really now, um, all that is left to say is, is thank you for, for taking the time to listen. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, and we really hope you enjoyed it. Um, there is still time to sign up to the second part in this series, um, which will take place at the same time tomorrow. 
Um, the link is on the screen now. Um, and alternatively, you can find this on our website um, under Our Impact and then Press Releases. Um, the webinar has also been recorded today, so we will be sharing the recording with you all um, and via our social media channels. Uh, so please share with any colleagues that might be interested. Um, and lastly, you can stay up to date with our latest research and thinking, um, and you can sign up to our newsletter by visiting the homepage of our website at www.kksadvisors.com. Thank you all and have a good rest of the day.